I am really appreciative of being here. I'd like to thank Professor Rella. I agree that the level of this meeting is inspirational and fantastic, and I'm really happy to participate in it. I have been asked to talk about the physiology and clinical aspects of reperfusion injury, and of course this topic really relates to the use of deceased donor transplants. So those of you who have been spoiled with live donor liver transplant, it is not perhaps something that you've thought about a lot, although I understand from what Dr. Professor Ella says that you may actually see some reperfusion injury with the way you're moving around organs, but in fact, this is really a problem of deceased. So I'd like to start out by giving you some definitions, talk about the manifestations of reperfusion injury, the incidents, uh, the outcomes, uh, some of the mechanisms, and some mitigating strategies, which I think are the most important and really uh, tie into what I think Professor Rayla was trying to uh, get us to think about in this afternoon session. So ischemia reperfusion relates to the endothelial injury that follows cold preservation and absent perfusion with subsequent reperfusion of the organ. Post-reperfusion or post-perfusion syndrome actually is a clinical uh, entity which relates to hemodynamic instability after an organ is reperfused. And it's defined by a drop in the mean arterial pressure uh, greater than 30% uh, of baseline that uh, lasts more than a minute, a minute or more within five minutes of graft reperfusion. So as we think about the clinical manifestations, we have to keep in mind the fact that our anesthesiologists are one step ahead of us and are already doing things uh, to try to prevent what we uh, have defined as, as post-perfusion syndrome. The clinical manifestations of both ischemia reperfusion and post-reperfusion uh, syndrome relate to metabolic acidosis, hypothermia, hypocalcemia, and hyperkalemia. And that's important because some of these uh, parameters are used as surrogate markers for reperfusion injury when you, when you review the literature. So in this uh, study, looking at 155 patients from the Netherlands, you, uh, you can see that 54 of them experienced this clinical manifestation of post-reperfusion injury that represents 34%. So quite common with a uh, deceased donor, and these are deceased donor transplants. Uh, now, the subsequent clinical manifestation of post-reperfusion injury tends to be early allograft dysfunction, and that has been defined by a number of investigators, including Kim Oltoff looking at the A2L, uh, the A2L uh, data, uh, but in general, it reflects abnormal biochemical parameters at various periods after transplantation. So uh, Kim described elevated bilirubin on day seven, elevated AST, elevated INR, and uh, uh, ALT. Uh, but you can see that there hasn't been total consensus uh, within the community, and there have been a variety of ways it has been defined, but in general, uh, abnormal liver function tests. Now, of course, what's important is what happens after there is a reperfusion injury. Most of the time, the grafts recover, but on occasion, and of course, what really gives us concern is the progression of early allograft dysfunction to primary non-function. And again, there's a fair amount of uh, difference in the, in the uh, criteria. I'll show you that in a moment. The incidence for primary graft dysfunction has been estimated to be between 30 and 50% primary non-function between 0.9 and uh, up to 10%. But primary non-function, as I said, is also uh, has a, a variable uh, definition depending on the time post-transplant. Uh, so uh, in general, it relates to the need for retransplant or progression to death. So that's defined by how nervous you are, how, how readily you can get another organ for the patient, uh, but you can see that it is sometime between day three and day seven post-transplant that the definition is made. UNOS has a criteria that enables us to rapidly retransplant patients with primary non-function. 
uh, and that is the, uh, the inclusion criteria for these patients are a serum AST level of greater than a th a 3,000 in combination of one or more of an INR greater than 2.5, acidosis, and uh, elevated serum lactate levels. And the clinical manifestations of PNF are a, uh, a, uh, a full-blown um, a loss could, is often a full-blown loss of liver function with hyperkalemia, elevated lactate levels, hemodynamic instability, oliguric renal failure, uh, persistent or new encephalopathy, acidosis, and hypoglycemia. So the mechanisms, as uh, Professor Rayler alluded to, relate to injury to the endothelium with uh, the uh, uh, elaboration of uh, of the, of the sinusoidal endothelium with elaboration of reactive oxygen oxidative pathways and an excessive systemic inflammatory response with high levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines such as uh, IL-6 or TNF-alpha, but a whole variety of, of cytokines have been identified. Uh, neutrophils are playing a place, uh, an important role in, um, in the reperfusion injury as well. I wanted to show you this data uh, from uh, Zurich, where uh, 17 patients who had relatively low MELDs were examined with uh, ultrasound and hemodynamic parameters at the time of uh, reperfusion at baseline and then through reperfusion of their grafts. And you can see that uh, the mean arterial pressure, none of these 17 patients, by the way, developed post-reperfusion uh, injury. Uh, you can see that the mean arterial pressure with reperfusion was maintained in general, although a little bit tighter. Um, the following slide shows you that the cardiac output, um, the cardiac output rose with uh, reperfusion, but the important thing that I want to uh, note for you is when um, cytokines were measured, all the cytokines went up with, and particularly uh, IL. Um, six, all the cytokines went up after reperfusion. So the notion that cytokine, a, that, that there's a magic cytokine that you can measure and that will give you an idea of reperfusion really doesn't hold. Uh, this is a nice uh, review article uh, from Greece of the mechanisms involved in the remote uh, organ uh, injury after uh, liver ischemia reperfusion. Uh, related to both the cytokine release, uh, the react reactive oxygen species, and the endothelial uh, cell uh, damage. Uh, and it's particularly notable for the kidney, but also notable for a variety of other organs that may be affected with, uh, with reperfusion. Uh, so it's not just the liver uh, problems that we see. We see cardiac instability. We see acute renal failure. We see a change in the gut barrier. Uh, we can see a lung injury uh, and, a pancre and pancreatitis as well. Um, a nice study uh, from Japan looked at, again, the mechanisms that have been described, uh, particularly in the steatatic uh, liver uh, that's used with both uh, reactive oxygen species, but also neutrophil accumulation. That's a very important uh, aspect of reperfusion injury. And they talk about yet a third aspect of the injury that relates to compromised blood flow, uh, compromised flow in the uh, sinusoids with the swollen hepatocytes and activation of the stellate cells. So it's not just the reactive oxygen species, and it's not just the neutrophil accumulation and release of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, various factors, uh, but also blood flow following it. Um, so what are, what's the recovery? Uh, after reperfusion injury. Uh, this is a study looking at 700 patients from the University of Miami uh, where uh, they actually found uh, no impact on either graft survival uh, or patient survival in the patients who had reperfusion uh, uh, injury and delayed graft uh, function, uh, which is interesting because certainly these patients are more costly uh, for transplantation. Now, this is not uniformly uh, the, the findings in the literature, and other uh, investigators have found uh, change in graft survival and rejection free sur and, and graft and patient survival after reperfusion injury. Another way to look at it uh, is a study out of um, the Cambridge group where they actually looked at um, 
histologic evidence of reperfusion injury. It's not really time zero biopsies, but it's one hour after reperfusion uh, biopsies in nearly 500 patients who underwent liver transplantation uh, in, that, uh, in that setting. And you can see that the patients who had mild, um, uh, no uh, evidence, histologic evidence of reperfusion injury, uh, the patients with mild or moderate reperfusion injury uh, did not have an impact on either patient or graft survival, but those patients who had severe um, evidence of reperfusion injury, and that's manifest by neutrophilic infiltrate, hepatocyte dropout, and hepatocyte necrosis, those patients clearly had a negative effect, uh, both in terms of graft function, graft survival, as well as patient survival in that series. And uh, this represented about 4.6% of their total population, so about 22 patients. Um, and you can see that those patients who had uh, severe, uh, actually, uh, uh, it, when they analyzed the patients with mild and moderate reperfusion injury, uh, they found a correlation with the reperfusion injury and hyperkalemia, as we've seen, and early graft dysfunction. So even in the patients who did not have severe uh, reperfusion injury, there was an effect. And in the patients with severe uh, reperfusion injury, shown on the next slide, I hope. Can you give me the next slide, please? Of the uh, 22 patients with severe reperfusion injury, uh, only uh, four of them survived. So six of them, uh, actually, uh, 10 of them uh, either required retransplantation or died. So they clearly saw a uh, negative impact in patients with severe reperfusion injury, unlike the group uh, from Miami. So we've been talked that a number of factors relate to this reperfusion injury, uh, the donor uh, factors, uh, whether or not it's a deceased uh, brain dead donor versus a, uh, a deceased after cardiac death donor, the donor age, the donor risk index, and graft steatosis, which we heard yesterday, is not the same as the donor risk index. With regards to the recipient, the MELD, the left ventricular dysfunction, if any, and then a number of intraoperative factors, such as the cold ischemic time, warm ischemic time, blood loss, uh, and whether or not uh, a shunt is done. Uh, this is the, these are the inclusion criteria for making uh, a diagnosis of expanded criteria donors, donors with three or more of these factors, and you can see that the DRI, the donor risk index, as well as uh, the presence of, this actually includes both donor factors as well as intraoperative factors to define a, an organ as an expanded criteria donor. Uh, and the, this uh, is, uh, again, looking at that data from uh, the Miami group, uh, which show that the independent risk factors for the reperfusion injury include uh, the age of the donor, uh, the donor risk index, and the uh, CVP of the recipient. Uh, and of course, our anesthesia colleagues are always working on that uh, to try to mitigate uh, that issue. Another way to look at it uh, in uh, patients with deceased after cardiac death donors uh, is reflective in this, in this uh, study of 130 patients uh, from the uh, Chinese group uh, where they showed an association of, um, they chose their patients based on the presence of hyperkalemia. So we have to, obviously, the, that, that, uh, uh, that divides the two groups up. But you can see in the second arrow that the incidence of post-reperfusion syndrome is much higher in those patients who had uh, hyperkalemia. So 72% of the patients with hyperkalemia uh, had post-reperfusion injury. So these uh, uh, entities go hand in hand. And uh, the further association was made both with uh, post-reperfusion syndrome as well as macrosteatosis. So a graded increase in the post-reperfusion injury in those patients who had uh, increasing amounts of fat within the liver. And again, this is in a DCD uh, donor. So both in the brain death donor as well as the DC do D DCD donor, we see a, um, uh, a magnification of this problem. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the mitigating strategies. Uh, we've heard a little bit about preservation. Transplant technique is an area that's quite interesting. In fact, there really is no consensus. Uh, Jean Laroute uh, did a um, survey of transplant surgeons in Europe asking them uh, 
about what kind of technique they used, how, uh, whether the order of their vascular anastomoses, whether or not they did a gradual release of portal uh, venous flow, whether they flushed out the splanchnic circulation through the infrapatic cava or through an, another means, and actually found no consensus. Uh, however, we think that using a piggyback technique, uh, using conventional order of anastomosis might be okay, but in those patients who are receiving a steatotic graft or a graft, a DCD graft or an older graft, perhaps these issues are important. A number of antioxidant uh, therapies have been tried. None of them really have been shown effective. Um, N-acetylcysteine has been shown in a, in a randomized trial to not be effective. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, civellostat, uh, and uh, I think there may be some promise with a, a Wnt uh, uh, an, a, antagonist. Um, machine preservation, however, really seems to be, again, the answer here. So civellostat is a neutrophil elastase inhibitor. Uh, and, it, and using it really reflects the importance that we think the neutrophils play in this re-perfusion um, injury. Uh, this is a study uh, looking at the effects of neutrophil adhesion uh, using, it, this is an in vitro study with uh, human uh, umbilical cord uh, umbilical uh, endothelial cells, and you can see with increasing do doses there's actually inhibition of uh, neutrophil adhesion. So the important part that neutrophils play are reflected here. Uh, this is a study in the rat looking at reperfusion injury and uh, enzymes after reperfusion with and without civellostat, and you can see a diminution both in AST, ALT, and LDH in the animals in whom uh, civellostat was used. Uh, so this, I think, is a promising uh, agent. It's actually used in humans with inflammatory lung disease uh, and has actually been shown to be effective in those patients, so it's, it can be used in humans as well. Uh, here's the uh, results of the liver biopsy in those animals uh, where you can see that without treatment, there's a fair amount of hepatocyte necrosis, neutrophil infiltrate, which is shown better here, and really normal-looking um, parenchyma. And again, this is in a rat model, uh, but shows some promise, I think. Normothermic machine preservation, uh, of course, is an example, and perhaps the best example, of how we might improve the post-perfusion syndrome. Uh, this reflects a study out of, uh, from Peter Friend's group out of the UK. The patients with normothermic norm perfusion uh, and uh, the cold storage patients were uh, matched in terms of a recipient and donor factors. Um, actually, there was not real evidence of a change in reperfusion injury in these uh, groups of patients, although uh, the uh, uh, I'm sorry, this slide shows you the cold ischemic time. The cold ischemic time is actually much shorter in the cold, uh, was uh, much shorter in the machine preservation patients, but of course the patients were selected to have that uh, and uh, doesn't form the basis of any conclusions that we can make. When you look at the donor risk index, however, they're pretty much the same uh, for the two groups, uh, although there is much longer preservation in the machine preservation group. Uh, much shorter cold ischemic time, but of course uh, the livers are put on the machine. Uh, at 90 minutes uh, post reperfusion, there was significant, uh, 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 significant difference in the mean arterial pressure uh, of those patients in the machine preservation group being higher than those patients with cold storage. Um, and perhaps more importantly, the use of norepinephrine to maintain the blood pressure uh, was much uh, lower in the machine preservation group, and I think that reflects the fact that the anesthesiologists have already anticipated what's going to happen in these patients. So this is graphically shown here with no real change. I'm sorry, this is very difficult. No change in the blood pressure, the mean arterial pressure here, but you can see a much increased use of uh, pressors, norepinephrine, uh, during the reperfusion period in those patients with cold uh, preservation. And the use of uh, both uh, whole blood and blood products was much higher 
in the group of patients who had machine, uh, who had cold storage compared to those patients with machine preservation. So I think this really demonstrated both a um, much easier course in the operating room and a much less, uh, much decreased use of, uh, of uh, uh, blood. In summary, uh, ischemia reperfusion and post-reperfusion syndrome lead to varying degrees of allograft dysfunction. I think we do pay a price in terms of short-term function, and in some studies, it looks like we pay a real price in terms of long-term function and patient survival. Uh, liver allograft dysfunction may lead to multi-system uh, dysfunction as well, uh, and uh, the factors that are, are uh, important in reperfusion injury relate both to the donor, the recipient, and intraoperative factors. Mitigating strategies will be increasingly important as we use higher risk donors and higher risk recipients. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is really a very exhaustive lecture.